All right. Well, welcome back to Eschatology Matters. I'm your host, Josh Howard. And I want to remind you, if you have not already, be sure to subscribe to Eschatology Matters. You can do so whether on our YouTube platform or you can find us uh, on podcast aggregators, wherever you get your podcasts in audio only format. But be sure to subscribe to the channel. That way you can keep up with uh, all of the content that we have coming out. And as always, we do encourage people to check out our website, eschatologymatters.org. If you go to that website, that sort of functions as a central hub. Um, you can find most of our content there. There. You can find directions uh, to articles. You can find different graphics and helps that are available on there as well. And you can find information on our uh, annual conference. But today I'm joined uh, by Nathan Anderson. I want to go ahead and jump right in. So Nathan, thank you so much for joining me today, brother. Hi, Josh. Thanks for the invite. Nathan, uh, give us a little uh, a little bio, a little background on yourself. I have encountered you, and I'm I'm sure probably if 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 people are familiar with you, they're probably familiar with you through the documentary and through the filmmaking that you've done. But just walk us into that a little bit, Nathan, and and what you're up to. Sure. Yeah, my name's well, Nathan Anderson. I live here in South America in in Chile, in a small town on the coast called Pichilemu. Um, yeah, I made a film back in 2020 called On Earth As It Is In Heaven on the topic of post-millennial eschatology, uh, released that, and since then made another film called uh, Teach All Nations. Well, really a, a docu-series that's on uh, lore, just kind of a follow-up to the first project. And yeah, that's what I've been doing mostly these days, working in, in term, as a filmmaker and serving as an elder here in our local church as well. Okay. So you serve as a local elder and that's awesome to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Nathan, tell me, tell me a little bit, cause I want to get into, um, I want to get into a little bit about the, the documentary. Um, I've not caught up on your, your most recent one. We were talking just before this and obviously I need, I have some catching up to do. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the documentary, a little bit about your eschatology, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but how have you, how did you get into filmmaking and how have you seen that particularly like where you're serving, you're serving as an elder, which I think is commendable. Um, I think we need men serving in the local church. Um, uh, but then you also have this project of doing filmmaking, doing videography, that, that sort of things. How, how did you get into that? And how have you seen that kind of serve and benefit the local church? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm pretty recent actually to the whole filmmaking thing. I mean, I I picked up a camera for the first time probably in like 2016, and you know just start started learning some of the basics, and then yeah, by 2018, I I wanted to do this. I decided I want to do this documentary. Uh, I actually originally was um, gonna just do it in Spanish, and I actually did about th four or five interviews of different pastors and missionaries I know here in Spanish and, and, um, uh, but, you know, I was pretty new to, um, uh, to the filmmaking and made a lot of mistakes. And so I was actually going to have to reshoot a lot of those interviews. Um, and then I had a the chance to travel to the States and I, you know, got to interview Doug Wilson and, and Steve Gregg and a few other folks. Um, and yeah, just, there was some political unrest when I got back home in 2019 and the country was a little bit kind of shut down for, for a while, riots in the streets and all kinds of fun oh, wow. stuff. And, um, so I wasn't able to go reshoot those interviews that I needed. So I decided just to do it in, in English ultimately. And that ended up being, you know, uh, quite, uh, providential because, uh, it it ended up you know going a long ways i guess and, and definitely a lot farther than i thought it was going to go i mean my my primary motivation at that time was well there's not really a lot of books and and materials in spanish right now on the topic of post millennialism mm. so you know maybe i should make a film basically that was that right. was the the motivation and um and yeah so i ended up releasing it in english i actually recently released a version dubbed over in spanish as well so things kind of came full circle finally was able to have the spanish version as well so yeah that's kind of how i started off uh with all of this and and yeah just have just been continuing from there uh teach all nations is kind of a follow-up in terms of, you know, the, the first project on earth as is in heaven, just kind of explains some of the basic tenets of post-millennialism and also how I came to that view, basically. Um, and then teach all nations hopefully is more of a practical application of what does, you know, if, if, if we really have a long ways to go, if, if, you know, 
if we are going to start thinking in a multi-generational manner, uh, what would that look like? And and just kind of teasing out some of those aspects of the Christian worldview um, in terms of family, economics, um, politics, even a little bit. And so a number of these um, issues like that. Yeah, no. And I want to I want to go ahead and not to detract from from people watching the uh, the documentary, but I want to ask you a little bit about how that was that you got into post-millennial thought, how you were introduced to that, how 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 you saw that develop within your own walk. But it's interesting just you talking about documentary and the power of that medium. Um, we, we've talked about this on our channel before. Uh, you, you see a lot of well, there's been a dearth. There's been a very uh, a very big need and um, a kind of a gaping lack of Christian storytelling, I think, over the years. And, and and for a lot of us, we have the greatest story, right? We have the great true story of scripture. Um, and and this world functions on story and story is very uh, persuasive. It, it it carries, you know, it, it it's emotive. It brings your feelings up and down. It, it brings you into something that's bigger than yourself. And I think for a lot of Christians, they're rediscovering the power of that medium because, you know, I can talk all day or you, you as an elder, like we can, we can teach or preach but it's when you present something in that format that's engaging. Um, it, it's 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 just a it's a facet of Christian teaching and discipling that I think is kind of being rediscovered in a sense. Have you seen that? Yeah, definitely. I've noticed a lot of people are are starting to get more involved and in seeing the value of something like a documentary, and especially in this day and age, in terms of you know the distribution and how. Because I mean, like my film, for example, I literally just made it myself, edit it for a few months and then put it on YouTube and Facebook. That's, you know, that's how I started out and didn't even know what to do with it. And, and ultimately got on a few other platforms like Canon and Amazon, but you could just make, it's, it's just amazing the world we live in where you could just make something uh, without, you know, asking anyone's permission in a way and just put it up on the internet and, yeah. and watch it uh, gain some traction. So, yeah, I think it's an amazing medium right now for sure. And uh, documentaries and just film in general, I think there's a lot of great opportunities for Christian artists to uh, make content that's just meaningful and that uh, really communicates um, things that are important. Yeah, no, I think it's for for a lot of us. Well, I don't know, maybe maybe not for you, but but the older I get, you know, the more I tend to complain about things. And so you see things like podcasts, you see things, see things like videos, and you say like, there's a lot of junk out there. Um, you know, there's a lot of bad things being communicated, and that's true enough. But like, just for us as Christians to see that as a positive, this is an opportunity. Like, you can literally make videos and documentaries. You can do a podcast now. Of course, the joke is like everybody has a podcast, but still, you can do these things and actually communicate. Um, this story to a world that needs it. Um, that's just a, that's a wonderful modicum. How, how do you wind up with post-millennialism as a topic? This is, so this, this was like kind of your first major foray then into, into maybe yeah. documentary making. Yeah, for sure. This was definitely my first, you know, um, longer film. And I, yeah, again, I, I originally, well, I, I became a post-millennialist, I guess about eight years ago. I'm something along those lines. I, I start my interest in eschatology probably started about 15 years ago or so, um, you know, started learning about, um, uh, well, well, actually I, I share a little bit about this in the film, but um, I got a copy of Steve Gregg's uh, revelation Four views commentary, right. uh, read that all the way through and um, just was fascinated by the different perspectives and, um, coming towards the book of revelation and, and, you know, growing up, um, I mean, my parents weren't, you know, really hardcore dispensationalists or anything, but, you know, just kind of the ethos of, of evangelical churches I was in was, Oh, you know, you always knew about the rapture and about these, these ideas at least or and just assume them. Okay. That's, that's, what's going to happen, I guess. Um, and so when I started studying these things uh, for myself in that sense, um, you know, uh, learned about partial preterism and actually pr probably remained, you know, uh, kind of a partial preterist, amillennialist for about um, six or seven years, I would say. And um, and then it, uh, just I guess I, I think it was a, a series of, of lectures by Doug Wilson, actually that really pushed me in that direction. Mm. And, um, uh, and it wasn't really even talking about the book of revelation. 
um, you know, because most people, when they focus on on eschatology and on these issues, like, oh, well, you know, we have to figure out what Matthew 24 is about and what, you know, the book of Revelation is about. And that's that's about it. Uh, but I think it was a bunch of other questions that postmillennialism was answering from a bunch of other texts that um, really was what I found attractive um, in, in that sense. Yeah. And um, uh, and so in in some ways, my my view of revelation of the book of Revelation and all that didn't change all that much when I became a postmillennialist. Um, but in terms of, uh, yeah, that listening to those, some of those lectures, um, you know, about the kingdom of God and, you know, uh, the nature of the kingdom, the growth of the kingdom and the old Testament promises in terms of, of, of the kingdom. I think that, uh, those are some of the issues that helped me, uh, move towards post-millennialism. So would you say then, because that's that's sort of a you know defining definitional feature that separates postmillennialism. Well, any of the millennial categories is really the nature and extent and presence of the kingdom. And you you launch in in your documentary pretty quick with uh, the kingdom as a present reality. Was that sort of the I don't know. Looking back, is that sort of one of the dr- the primary driving forces? Because you're you're mentioning a lot of things that that we've we've talked about and agree with. You know, the fact that um, you should have a whole Bible eschatology that it shouldn't just be a couple of key passages, but instead this should be like kind of the warp and woof of the entirety of Scripture that drives you to those things. But was that sort of one of the key features for you as the kingdom? Well, I think for me it was. Um... You know, the, this idea of historical optimism uh, in terms of what, you know, when Jesus, you know, left, right, when, when he ascended to heaven um, and he, he, he said he, he promised he would return, what exactly was supposed to happen in the intermediate part, you know, from his ascensions to his final return? Is, is there a vision? Is there a goal? to be accomplished and, you know, related to the great commission. I mean, disciple the nations. Is that, uh, is, is that a task that Jesus was expecting his disciples to actually uh, complete? Mm. Uh, or, or is it just a general mandate to kind of go out there and preach in a lot of different places? And at some random point, you know, God, Christ is going to return basically. Mm. And so, you know, those kind of issues um, are, are where I see, uh, uh, as, as being, um, very important to post-millennialism and things that are very much overlooked by both amillennialism and premillennialism, because, uh, for the most part, you know, there is an expectation that maybe at different points in history, there could be revival and there could be, uh, you know, um, in, in terms of advances in the kingdom, but there's no expectation of overall growth um, as in terms of when Christ returns, I guess. And so things could go up for a, for a while, but then they could go just straight back down. And in fact, there's an expectation that at the end, things are going to get really bad. You know, it doesn't matter in that sense, if you're, you know, all mill or, or pre mill, I mean, it's either the great tribulation in your future or, you know, the great apostasy, but either way it's, it's going to end, um, in a, in a way that is, is negative in terms of the, the, the church in the world and, um, uh, and, and the forces of Satan, uh, you know, seeming to dominate during this p- present period in that sense. And so I think, um, considering those issues and, and I mean, if that's what the Bible teaches, fine. Right. I mean, obviously we're not going to decide what we believe just based on what we would like the things to be, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, just from studying scripture, I don't think that is the, you know, that's ultimately the story that God is telling in redemptive history. And I don't think that's the place that this present age has uh, to play in that story. Mm. So, so you mentioned optimism, and I, I find that really interesting because uh, a lot of the conversations we have on this kind of revolve around these words of optimism and pessimism. And I understand that, you know, to an extent, that's sort of a, you know, a war of words type thing and who gets to define what those things mean. But in general, uh, a lot of people are trying to kind of suss out um, 
Well, in general, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to ask you this question because a lot of what you did was comparative, right? Like, so you open up and pretty quick, you're introducing people to the Four Views book and um, you're doing the author interview and you're talking about comparing these different eschatological takes, which for most Christians, I think is, is probably uncharted territory, right? This, this would be something new. And you're talking about them compared to one another. And I, I just wonder what has been your uh, experience and specifically from your research and your uh, interviews that were in that documentary and in the subsequent documentaries, what's been your take on the optimism versus pessimism factor? Because I know for a lot of people, they would say, well, you can still be, you can be optimistic and not be post-millennial and fair enough, but you're specifically talking about the extent or reign of Christ's kingdom in this world or in this age prior to his second coming. But suss that out a little bit for us. Yeah, the whole optimism versus pessimism um, issue is one that I'm often, I think um, there's a lot of misunderstandings. There's a lot of, um, I, I guess that's one of those those arguments that, um, yeah, uh, sometimes um, gets people a little angry. It's like, you know, are you calling me a pessimist or something? Sure. But uh, I think it's important to qualify what is being said by postmillennialists when we talk about optimism we we we're talking about historical optimism we're talking about because obviously every christian is optimistic in terms of that one day christ will return right. one day you know we will all enter the eternal state and um, there will be no sin no death and and so we're all optimistic in that regard right. but not all christians are optimistic about the extent of salvation or ex or the extent of the influence of the gospel in the world in this present age. That's what we're talking about. So that's why we qualify it as historical optimism, because we're talking about history. And when Christ returns at the end of history, that's, you know, that's another, uh, you know, we could call that, you know, eternal state optimism or something like that. <laughs> but we're talking about historical optimism and what is our expectation for the church in the present age, basically. And so yeah. I think it's important to make that uh, distinction and um, and also understand that, um, you know, it, it's interesting because in, in other times, you know, um, it, it, people were, or, or, you know, even amillennialists and, and premillennialists weren't shy about saying, yeah, we're not optimistic about, uh, you know, the, the situation of the church in this present age, you know, mm -hmm. and and some um, still aren't, right? Yeah, <laughs> and um, uh, I, I forgot the author, but um, I, I one Amel author was would say, you know, um, I think Ken Gentry quotes it in 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 his book that you know we agree with the premillennialists on this point. Like we we don't believe that the world's going to get better. In fact, we believe the world's going to get worse before the return of Christ. In that sense, mm. and so. Um, uh, that's kind of an, an area where, you know, the post-millennial uh, view really um, emphasizes and, and is really important in part in that discussion. But the problem is it's a discussion that the other views aren't having because they're for the, for the most part in agreement. You know, they might disagree on some of the details and exactly, you know, some of the where they'd place this or that passage of scripture. But for the most part, they agree that this present age is not you know, an age where the gospel actually conquers the world or the mm. gospel actually uh, transforms uh, fundamentally all the nations of the earth. Mm. Yeah. And I, I feel like you framed that really well. So in in the documentary, the the 2020, was that right? 2020 documentary? Yeah, 2020. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh -huh. the, the 2020 documentary, um, you open with, uh, or at least pretty, pretty, close to the opening, you have John Hagee, and he's speaking about the the Great Tribulation. And I know people could say, like, that's John Hagee, and that's not a great example. But it was still, it, it was it was good to frame kind of the pictures. So you got John Hagee, and he's saying, there's nothing to look forward to in this world other than the rapture of the church. Like, everything's going to be bad. They're going to get raptured. Things are going to get worse, that sort of thing. You had footage from the Thief of uh, thief in the Night, uh, you know, video or uh, movie from back in the day, which which is always compelling and a little bit frightening, but you, you've got that picture. And that's, that's sort of what you're painting is it's going to get bad here. This is pessimism in this world, in this age, in this time, whatever you want to frame it as. Um, but you're framing something completely different from that. I, I felt like that was kind of like setting, setting the table for that. Is that, is that what you're aiming for? 
Yeah. And, and I, I mean, in part, so the, in the film, obviously I'm not dealing with all the different eschatological positions. I mean, some, some folks, you know, have, have commented to me like, Oh, well, why didn't you talk about like, I'm like pre mill pre wrath, you know, this position and I'm, and I'm, uh, you know, why didn't you interact with amillennialism? And basically, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a documentary. It's a, it's a film with limited time and, uh, and so obviously the most common view in terms of Bible prophecy in North America and frankly, probably in most of the evangelical world is dispensationalism, even mm. to this day. And so um, in that sense, that's most of the reason why I framed it in that way, you know, with someone like John Hagee or Hal Lindsey or these kinds of folks, because frankly, they're the ones that have had the, what, so, some of the biggest impact in Maybe not, you know, on the scholars or something like that, but just in general, in terms of evangelicalism, and and also just in terms of my childhood and the the kind of people I grew up around. I mean, those were uh, the kinds of voices they were listening to, right? And and I think that's the the also the experience of a lot of other people, you know, and in terms of of that kind of dispensational outlook was pretty much the mainstream. Right. And obviously that's changing to some extent these days. I mean, there's a lot more even inside the dispensational camp, you know, there's progressive dispensationalism and, you know, they, they're taking a different view on a few things. And amillennialism has definitely um, become more well-known in broader evangelical circles. And and obviously postmillennialism is as well has kind of been almost rediscovered by a lot of people uh, because everyone thought they, it died out after the first two world wars, basically. Right. So that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's what everyone seems to have been told. Right. It yeah. Was, it was interesting. I just saw, um, I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but I just saw, I think it was a Lifeway survey and they were surveying uh, specifically pastors. And it was something like, like post-millennial was somewhere in the low teens. I want to say Amil was somewhere in the mid thirties percentage wise. And then, um, uh, premillennialism in all its forms was somewhere like 48% or something like that. So you got to assume like mm -hmm. in many pulpits, at least, and again, I, th I don't have the research in front of me. I can't remember if that was just SBC churches or if that was evangelical or what, but you have to assume in a lot of pulpits, that's going to be what you're hearing is just kind of an assumed premillennialism, even if it's not very sussed out or, or doctrinally, yeah. you know, clear. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So t tell me this, I'm going to throw you in the hot water um, just a little bit on this one. I, I, but I was, I was curious, Nathan, because you, you you made a comment. Um, you said uh, that most attacks, this was on Twitter, I was just stalking you a bit, but you said most attacks against Christian nationalism and theonomy are proxy wars against post-millennialism. And I was curious about this because, so, so obviously, again, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing us into the deep end a little bit, but there's been a lot of conversations recently about Christian nationalism, theonomy, all, all those type of things. Are we to disciple the nations or just people out of the nations? What does that look like? How do we apply God's law? So there's a lot of there's a lot of ground to cover. We probably don't have time to do that today. But a lot of the conversation that's been interesting to me is what exactly is the maybe the foundation um, that we're that we're discussing these things. What's the lens through which we're viewing this conflict? What is what is the actual lightning rod that's causing this conflict? And for some, they've come out and said, you know, this is an inherently eschatological, you know, position. This is why we're having these conflicts. This has to do with eschatology. Others are are less convinced. What's your what's your take on sort of the the current kerfuffle, but also wh why why do you throw post millennialism in there? And 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 like how do you how do you suss that out? Yeah, so um, I think for me, the issue of eschatology is very much foundational to the Christian worldview in general. I mean, I, I think eschatology, um, I mean, it's, I think it's a secondary issue in terms of salvation or something like that. Like, I don't think people are are going to hell because they're premillennial or something along those lines. Right. But I do think it has a impact on our view of, of, of how we see the kingdom of God, our view of how we understand our place in this world. And, um, and, and, and again, if, if we are in the, if we're the terminal generation, you know, to use that, the, the older lang uh, language in terms of the seventies and eighties, if, mm -hmm. if we're just waiting for the rapture and it's happening at any moment and all the signs are lined up, um, then obviously that's going to have an impact on how we live our lives. I was talking to someone the other day who was, um, you know, 
an older gentleman I know. And he was saying, yeah, when I, um, when I was in college, I had one more year left of college and I, you know, started to get into all this eschatology stuff. And I was like, why finish college? You know, I mean, it's, wow. you know, Jesus is coming back. It doesn't make any sense. And he didn't finish college, you know? And, um, and obviously that had an impact on his life and, and a number of other things. Mm -hmm. But so, so just that idea of what is our expectation for the future? What do we think uh, the Bible teaches about the future and about the nature of the kingdom and, and the success of, of the work of the kingdom in this world? Like that's going to have a huge impact on our lives. Right. So that's why I find the conversation to be important. And when we get into the issue of of politics, um, I definitely think it's it's important. And when we start talking about discipling uh, the nations and considering every area of life, and I I still remember I was at a talk um, of an author who's written some books on discipling the nations, not necessarily from a eschatological perspective, but just on that issue and the importance mm -hmm. of, uh, of discipling all the nations and all that. And he gave a great talk about, you know, discipling every area of life and education and science and, uh, politics and all that. And at the end of the talk, um, you know, uh, they, they handed the microphone to, a, they had a, a little question and answer time and a lady, you know, grabbed the microphone and she was like, thank you very much for your talk. That was, that was very interesting. But, um, on your, when you were saying we need to disciple education and all that. And I, she's like, I was thinking to myself, like, um, why, you know, like what, what good is it to try to, you know, establish a Christian presence in education and turn things around. Well, she said, we all know that the it's the end is coming. Like, you know, Jesus is coming back any minute, you know, the, the, the signs are all there. So why yeah. would I invest time in that? You know? And, and I remember the speaker, you know, giving kind of a 30 second response that wasn't the best, but I, I thought it was very interesting that his whole talk on worldview in one sense was kind of invalidated by this one lady's question on eschatology. Yeah. Right? No and, and, and in the minds of a lot of people that were listening that probably thought the same as, as she did. Um, I think it, it would have very, been very um, productive to have actually discussed first, almost the issue of eschatology and then move on to the Christian worldview, because if you get eschatology wrong, it will affect how you live your life ultimately. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, so, interesting. Yeah. it's interesting that you see a lot of people, they've retrieved this kind of vision of, of eschatology is not just the last chapter of the book. And it's not just the last, you know, five minutes of my story or whatever that looks like, but instead eschatology, in fact, precedes protology, right? This is something that sort of drives the story. There's a description of that huge story, but we still view it as disconnected from things like you're talking about. Whereas you're pointing out that's, that's sort of impossible. It's, it's impossible to, you know, to, to, to bifurcate eschatology from those conversations. Um, it's also interesting to me, Nathan, and, and maybe you can speak a little bit to this, that you're, you're giving this, uh, this, this sort of vision of discipling the nations, which just in the inclusion of that definite article, I know is a, a source of contention right now, but you're, you're giving this vision of discipling the nations and you're giving it from South America uh, because oftentimes I hear the pushback, at least from American scholarship, that um, any view toward discipling the nations or applying God's law word to the nations, um, proclaiming it rather to the nations, any view of that is sort of it's American LARPing or it's American cosplay. Like this is something that um, that American Christians like to, you know, dress up in fancy hats and, and pretend like we're going to do this sort of thing. But you're writing this from South or excuse me, not writing, but you're uh, you know speaking about this from South America. Can you talk into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's important to have that um, to consider that this is a this it's not a North American project; it's a global project in terms of the discipling of the nations. And post millennialism was the driving force behind you know the modern missions movement for the most mm -hmm. part. You know, you think of guys like uh, William Carey, you know, or or George Patton, or others um, um, who went out to the nations because of the promises of God in scripture that the nations would be discipled. And they, they went out um, hoping to have a long lasting presence in India or in Africa or these different places. 
And so, yeah, I think it is important to, to connect those two. And um, I think Doug Wilson says uh, sometimes that, you know, when he's at a missions conference, he can just preach about post-millennialism pretty much because under the title of missions, because everyone receives it that way, basically. Mm. And, and I think it is, you know, post-millennialism um, is very much um, a driving force um, or can be a driving force in missions, obviously over the last 100, 150 years, um, you know, at least in England and North America, people have moved away from that perspective. And the rest of the evangelical world has kind of followed suit. Um, but because of their example, I mean, mm. uh, ironically, it's it's ironic, even here in South America, because, you know, like they translate Matthew Henry's commentary into Spanish, for example, a number of years ago. And they just omitted his whole eschatology section and replaced it with something else because they're like, nope, we don't we don't need any of that, <laughs> well, you know. Uh, and so that's where there's you know that that's why it's so important to have a at least in 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 Spanish and in other contexts have a recovery or a, a rediscovery of of this view yeah. in a lot of ways. And so that's what you know at least the projects I'm working on. Um, obviously hope they have an impact in, in, in North America, but I also hope they have an impact in other nations as well, because again, this is a global vision for the absolute conquest of the world, um, in, and for the kingdom of God to extend to all the nations of the earth and, and not just to be present, but to actually, you know, transform those nations. Yeah. So what is that? What does that look like in your context, the transforming of the nations? Because I think that's where for a lot of Christians, well, I'll just speak to the American context, right? This, this is where I am. Um, a lot of American Christians look around and we, we see, you know, hurdles, we see giants in the land, we see we see obstacles in the way and people think, well, what, what's the point of even talking about discipling the nations like that? This is this seems like a you know, an unachievable task and, and certainly nothing that I have any sort of, you know, step one, two, three, like what's in front of me? How can we possibly disciple the nations? But, but again, you're, you're coming from a context where I don't, I don't suspect there's a whole lot of, well, I don't know. You, 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 how do you, how do you approach discipling the nations from your context? And what does that look like? How do you encourage your people to, to think toward those ends? Yeah. I mean, obviously we we're, we're in a context here that um, I mean, you know, evangelical Christianity is even more um, irrelevant than in the States, right. for sure. Um, we're very much the min minority, even though Chile is a small country. I think we're only like eight, 19 or 20 million people. Um, but we're still a pretty small uh, minority here uh, in this country. But again, the I think the the vision for discipling nations is the same uh, you know, whatever the odds are, because mm. the, the promises of God in scripture, as, at least as I understand them, is that the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge uh, of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so however many giants there are, they're going to be defeated. Maybe not this year, maybe not next year. I mean, you think about someone like William Carey, who goes all the way to India and, I mean, I, I I I went to India a number of years ago. It's a very pagan place. Mm. Like if you if you think of North America is pagan, man, spend a few weeks in India. That's it's a very pagan place, and there is a very small percentage of Christians. And even someone like William Carey, um, when he went there, uh, like in, if you want to just talk about how many how many converts and how much his church grew and all those things, it, it was it was not a lot to show for in some ways. Right. Um, but I, again, he understood the promises of God and he understood that, you know, that that the nation was ultimately going to be discipled. And so he was just laying the groundwork as he saw it and trying to work within his sphere of influence and with the giftings and callings that God uh, placed on his life. And so, I mean, I, I think you know, obviously there might be some aspects of being strategic in this or that situation, but I think that's all we're really called to do is to be faithful, to think long-term and, and see, you know, with the giftings and callings we have and, the, and where we've been placed, understanding, looking around us and understanding that this nation, wherever we are, belongs to the Lord. And, and, you know, that, 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 
Christ has inherited the nations and they all belong to him. And there's still some rebels holding out and, you know, there might be a lot of them, you know, mm-hmm. but it doesn't matter because ultimately they're going to one by one, they're going to fall. And, uh, you know, every day the kingdom of God advances. And as the kingdom of God advances, the key- kingdom of Satan has to take a step back basically. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we're, I mean, even where we're at here, we're facing some, you know, great challenges. I mean, we're in the middle um, our country the last three, four years has been going through a whole upheaval in terms of uh, basically an attempted Marxist takeover. They're wow. rewriting our, our constitution. Um, you know, they, they, there is riots in the streets. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on that if I, you know, didn't have an optimistic exotology, sure, I'd be like, well, yeah, there's, there, it, there it is. It, it, it all must be just about over. Um and so that's it. In other words, I think it it, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are, um, because ultimately our hope is in the promises of God, right? And our hope is is that that the 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 task of discipling the nations is one that God is going to accomplish. And remember too that that um, you know uh, the Holy Spirit is with us, right? The third person. Of the Trinity, I think that that aspect is sometimes very much downplayed by this idea of oh well how we could how we how could we ever expect some sort of success looking around at all the evil in the world as if God was not with us right, right. as if we did not have the Holy Spirit with us empowering us and empowering His Church to uh, accomplish the task set before us and so it's never made sense to me why. Do do we need Jesus to return, you know, uh, if we have the Holy Spirit right now? Because there's this idea of like, well, you guys are just trying to do it in the flesh. You're just trying to do it uh, yourselves. Right. And you, yep. it, the only way things are really going to change is if Jesus comes back. Uh, but then I say, wait a second. We have the Holy Spirit. He's God and he's with us. So how is that not enough? Mm. Yeah, I think I think that's the that's the pushback. And I, I understand people have, you know, convictions for a variety of reasons, but that's the that's the pushback that's never quite made sense to me. Um, is that to disciple the nations, number one, that it's that it's through some sort of man-made effort. You know, I I know those 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 guys may be out there, um, but it's certainly nobody within our conversations, right? Like nobody is saying the absent the Holy Spirit doing a mighty work, no one is saying this is possible, right? Like like the context you're describing is you know, intimidating uh, huge odds that are stacked against us, and yet we walk with the King of Kings. And I, th- I think that's the interesting thing for Christians is what we confess from Scripture. Um, most of the time, without any eschatological argument, is that uh, Christ has conquered uh, the evil forces in this world; that He has claimed authority in heaven and on earth; that He sent the Spirit and said, "This will be even better for you." Then He's given us this commission into the nations, and yet when it comes to the actual uh, prospect of success of that mission, all of a sudden, then we, it seems we take a step back. That's, that, that's just interesting to hear. And especially from your context of coming from somewhere where that's not an easy task, but like you said, you're not getting that, you're not getting confirmation for the success of your task by looking out your window or turning on the news channel. Right. Yeah. I mean, exactly. I mean, I think it's very important to have this discussion in terms of what does the Bible teach first and foremost, about what our expectations should be. And then, you know, walk in faith um, from what we've learned from the text, basically. Mm-hmm. I mean, yep. and and we could go farther back in history. It's not like Abraham, when he's in the desert, receiving all these promises of, of, of God about, you know, having descendants like the sand on the seashore. It's not like he had great prospects in front of him to go, oh, yeah, I can see that happening. <laughs> right. Uh, it, you know? Or, or even the disciples, when Jesus, you know, is is departing and gives them this commission, go out and disciple the nations, and right. go up against this giant empire, you know, and um and 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 change the world. That's that was uh, a tall order for mm-hmm. sure. And and so I think, yeah, ultimately it's an issue of trusting in the promises of God. Yeah. Now I think it's. This is an encouraging conversation for me because I think, you know, anytime we as Christians find ourselves, you know, facing those giant obstacles and those those seemingly insurmountable challenges, we, we can know that we're in good 
<laughs> we're in good company, right? Like this is where God's people have found themselves. And then God is oftentimes in those circumstances pleased to make good on his promises in ways we never could have imagined. Um, I just find that a massive encouragement. Um, Nathan, I, I appreciate the chat. Where, where can people follow you, keep up with you? Um, you've got ongoing projects, I'm, I'm guessing. Where can people keep up with your work and, and what you've got going on? Yeah, so um, I have a website, onearthfilm.net. And I usually publish um, my, you know, all the stuff for my films is there. You could you can watch On Earth As It Is In Heaven there for free, but it's also available on Amazon and on the Canon app. Uh, Teach All Nations is out as well. That is available through Lure.tv. So you guys can subscribe to Lure and watch it right now on that platform. And yeah, just um, just on Twitter. I'm I'm on Twitter and you know Facebook, a few other places like that. Very cool. Well, Nathan, thanks so much for uh, for joining us. And yeah, we'll we'll definitely be praying for you down there in in a uh, in a tough environment. But I appreciate you chatting with us today. Thanks, Josh. Seated here at my right hand.